Ralph Waldo Emerson said, the purpose of life is to be useful, to be honorable, to be compassionate, to have it make some difference that you have lived and lived well. The true definition of Dr. Kent Rogers. Good evening and welcome to Tiger Field and the memorial service for our mentor, our friend, our hero. I'm Leah Dill Blackard, Vice President of the Corsicana Independent School District's Board of Trustees. And on behalf of CISD, we are honored to have you here today to celebrate the incredible life of a Corsicana legend and our favorite Corsicana Tiger. Will you please stand for the representation of the colors presented today by the Corsicana High School's Air Force Junior ROTC. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the American and Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Please remain standing.
Other guard, you may retreat. We have one more special flag presentation this afternoon that uh, a flag was presented to us today that was flown over the capital of Texas on February the 1st, 2021, at the request of Senator Brian Birdwell and Representative Cody Harris. Mr. Myers is going to present that flag to Mrs. Rogers at this time. Please be seated. As a reminder, if you have not already, take a moment and silence your cell phones uh, out of good courtesy for what we're doing here today. We welcome all of you, as Leah said, to this celebration of life of our dear friend, Dr. Kent Rogers, and we're glad to have all of you here today, our family, our friends, our special guests, our honored dignitaries from our city council, from the Navarro College president and some of the board uh, to our mayor is here with us uh, as well today. Uh, and so thank you all for being here uh, in addition to District Attorney Thompson who is here as well. Special thank you today goes to Dr. Frost and the staff of Corsicana ISD for all their hard work in helping us to have this service here at beautiful Tiger Field today. How fitting it is that we had this service for Kent here at Tiger Field because once a tiger, always a tiger. And it's a motto that he lived by. And so we're honored to have that today. As we begin, let us join in prayer for God's servant, Kent. Let us pray. Almighty God, we remember this day before thee, thy faithful servant, Kent. And we pray that having opened to him the gates of larger life, thou wilt receive him more and more into thy joyful service, that with all who have faithfully served thee in the past, he may share in the eternal victory of Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. This time we'll begin our remembrances with Susie. Good evening, Navarra County, and friends and family across the nation joining us virtually. Thank you all for being here for the Rogers family and to honor my dear father, Dr. Kent Eugene Rogers, MD. I'm Susie Rogers Nelson, the nerd of the family. Just ask my brother. I took a little after my dad, I guess. You'll hear and read a lot about my dad's accomplishments, so I'll simply recite the statement at his statue. I work every day in a job that I love, with people whom I love, with family and friends whom I love in Corsicana, a city I love. This has filled my life with joy. And you may wonder, where did my father find his strength and compassion to bring so much healing to this community and to so many people? I'd like to introduce my mom, Donna Smith Rogers. She wrote that description of my dad's feelings that are on his statue plaque. My dad first set eyes on her at her brother's baseball game. She says it was like a lightning bolt, and they've been starstruck ever since. Not that there weren't struggles, but our whole family had so much fun together, almost all growing up together since the generations were so young and close together in our family. 
After the chickies left the nest, as my mom would say, my parents had a great time on their own as well with a wonderful group of friends. My mom was always there for my dad to fill up his heart so he could give to others, which he did constantly. But even as he gave to you, you gave to him as well. Our family will be forever grateful and enjoy memories of this moment and this community. As my dad, dad said in some of his last words, I am blessed, 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 blessed. He said this after seeing my daughter, his first grandchild, and the apple of his eye along with her brother Nicholas. And we all are blessed since we were able to know him and connect with him in healing, compassion, and love. In closing, I would like to read a villainette for my dad, written by Jim Bob Kingman. I actually had to look up what a villainette is, and it's a 19-line poem with two rhymes throughout, consisting of five tercets and a quartain, and I gave up on that. But I really like the poem, so I'm gonna read it to you anyway. Well, actually, I read the whole definition and I sought to understand it as I read along. See, my brother was right again, the nerd. But anyway, on with it. He died with a sword in his hand, a hero of a thousand faces striving to heal a broken land. No permission, the fates only demand, the labyrinth through which one ever races. He died with his sword in his hand. The rope is stronger than its weakest strand, enveloped and protected in embraces, striving to heal a broken land. Pro patria more, give all for the homeland and leave a legacy nothing disgraces. He died with the sword in his hand. In service, by example, not command, ennobling the most benighted places, striving to heal a broken land. The well-fought battle needs a final stand, the destination Moses never graces. He died with his sword in his hand, striving to heal a broken land. Thank you, Jim Bob, for that beautiful tribute. God bless and love to all. Mr. Smith, my apologies, we skipped right over the Navy hymn a moment ago. If you'll have the band play that for us now.
Good evening. My name is Eric Myers. I am your Navarro County Emergency Management Coordinator. Standing here this beautiful evening is bittersweet as we come together to remember and celebrate the life of our friend, Dr. Kent Rogers. Anyone who knew Dr. Kent Rogers, well, they didn't just know him, they were a friend. His smile, his laughter, and sincere nature were truly one of a kind. Kent taught me so much, not only through my time serving as emergency management coordinator for our county, but also as my doctor and as my friend. There are so many stories that could be told here tonight by everyone. So many stories that we simply could not fit them into one full evening, nor could we take all of the laughter for that long. Tank, I will never forget one of the many cowboy games that we all went to, especially the one where you, Bryson and I, ended up beating Larry and your dad back to the truck and simply hearing Larry coming over yelling at Kent in a funny way. How can a guy who graduated number one from Rice not find a car in a parking lot? These were the best memories for me. Little did I know at the beginning of 2020 how close our roles as a public health director and emergency management coordinator would bring us together. As we began to learn of this novel or new coronavirus, Dr. Rogers, Emily Carroll, Chief Paul Henley, myself, and numerous stakeholders began to prepare for the unknown. This was truly uncharted territory for all of us. One of the key parts of this operation for our county became the daily stakeholder calls in which health and medical officials, elected officials, public safety officials, and so many more would meet to discuss updates, mitigation, planning, and how to effectively provide updates for our entire community. It was throughout these calls that a man emerged as our leader. He never bowed away from doing what was right. He never worried about the criticisms. He simply did what he knew was the best to help our community stay safe and be the doctor he was for us all. Dr. Kent Rogers was the definition of a true servant leader. He worked day in, day out, seven days a week, caring for our entire county. There are many times that we would meet and talk. We would become exhausted or frustrated. But Kent was one who would always keep us motivated to continue. This from a man who was already physically exhausted. You see, Kent never let his own ailments stand in the way of helping others. Throughout this time, he continued to see his patients, he continued his work as a school board member, and he continued to be the man we all knew as Dr. Kent Rogers. His love and passion for our community never ceased. The night before Dr. Rogers passed away, I had the chance to meet with him and Donna and Tank and Susie. And to that night, Dr. Rogers was still inquiring about our operations and how many vaccinations had been done. This is something that he fought tirelessly and fearlessly to get up and running as quickly as possible. And we did that thanks to his leadership and his fight, his will and perseverance to tackle this pandemic were truly an inspiration to us all. 
Thank you, Dr. Rogers, for being a man I could call with questions about anything at any time. Your smile, your laughter, and sense of humor will be forever missed. To Donna, Mark, Susie, and Cindy, thank you on behalf of all of us in public safety for sharing your wonderful husband and your father with us and the entire community. We are truly blessed to have a friend, a leader, and a public health authority, and that of Dr. Kent Rogers. We will continue our fight, and we will always be there to block our man. The King of Love, my Shepherd is, whose goodness faileth never. I nothing lack if I am his, and he streams of living water flow, my ransomed soul he leadeth, and where the verdant pastures grow, with food celestial feedeth. Perverse and foolish oft I strayed, but yet in love he sought me. And on his shoulder gently laid, and home rejoicing brought me. In death's dark veil I fear no ill, with thee, dear Lord, beside me, thy rod and staff, my comfort still, thy cross before to guide me. And so through all the length of days thy goodness faileth never good shepherd may I sing thy praise. Within thy house forever. Amen.
greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. We all know that Dr. Rogers has been on the battlefield of this pandemic for the last year. And we all know that he actually died on this battlefield. However, when one looks at his life overall, he's been on the battlefields of his patients for over 50 years. It's all that he has known. Most of those years have been right here with us in Navarro County those here right now and those who are no longer with us. That's the guy whose life we are celebrating today. My words are underpowered. Most of the words that I have read on Facebook are underpowered. We simply do not have the vocabulary to describe a man like this and what he's done for us. He was a Rice University graduate, valedictorian of his medical class at UT Southwestern, had superb postgraduate training, and could have been on the faculty of any medical school. Yet he came to Corsicana and cared for us for the next 44 and a half years. And he did all of this after he and Donna married when he was 17 and Donna was 16. What a team he and his editor made. Now, I do realize that when people see my name on a program or see me stand up, they're expecting something funny. Humor is beyond my reach today, even though I think Kent would welcome it. He always did. I will say one thing that may seem funny. People have asked me if Dr. Rogers ever made a mistake. He made a big one with me. He loosely made the assumption that because I had an MD behind my name, that I knew what the heck he was talking about. <laughs> when we discussed the particle size of my cholesterol, I would just practice my pensive intellectual look. Since he sometimes mumbled, I would just mumble back. <laughs> Kent and I were definitely colleagues, as were all of the physicians in our community and in the surrounding communities. In addition, Kent and I were contemporaries. We were born 10 days apart. We came to Corsicana just about at the same time. But he was our intellectual leader and our mentor. He pondered things on a deeper plane, and yet he never spoke down to anyone, not me and not anyone else that's here today. Sometimes we would have a medical meeting, and he might take the opportunity to update us on the physiology of dehydration, vitamin D metabolism, or osteoporosis and he would do it before we could bat an eye. I was never with him in any venue that I did not learn something, whether I wanted to or not. Most of us will leave this life, and we will leave, well, all of us will leave this life. Most of us will leave an imprint on our fellow human beings. For most of us, it will be a narrow imprint. No one will ever say that about our friends. His imprint will always be tall and broad, touching so many, not only patients in his office, but far beyond. We will see his mark on our school system, the NCARC, medical directorships of nursing homes, hospice care, sports medicine, organized sports physicals, and many other things. So many people have reminisced about Kent, about his hosting of the medical arts Christmas parties. 
even dressing up like Lewis Gibson with his cowboy hat, his turquoise belt buckle, and cowboy boots. He'll be remembered for this humor also, and for the various stories he would weave at those parties. He was one of a kind. I'll never pass the health department. That I will not think of. I never sit here and look down to the sideline without seeing. I'll never drive my bicycle past the corner office of the clinic building without seeing him at his desk at 8 o'clock. And I will never sit in a rickety chair across from any doctor and actually feel the healing or the concerned warmth that I would feel in his office. I don't even think I will see a stethoscope that I don't think about him. So, I didn't intend to say anything funny today, although I know he would embrace it. He would always laugh at my jokes. He always did, quite a belly laugh. But I do know who God will call on when he has a stomach ache, dehydration, or clarification on a vitamin D dosage. He will call on our friend, Dr. Kent Rogers. And I hope that he and I will have reformed our medical partnership when that time comes, just in case God has morning sickness. How do we even begin to honor and celebrate a life as significant, as impactful, and as meaningful as Dr. Rogers? On his statue, it says, when needed, he answered the call. The truth is that he did much, much more than answer the call. In reality, he impacted, he changed all of our lives. He made us better because we knew him and he made our community, our school district, and our world better than it would have been without him. He found immense joy in answering the call. He was most happy and most spirited when he was serving others. He had the innate ability to know where he was needed and in his calmed, informed Kent Rogers way, he served all of us. Now, don't get me wrong, I have seen him get worked up. He cared deeply about actions that impacted the success of our students, the safety of our staff, the respect for our district, and the health of our community. Also on his statue, he is described as tireless, respectful, and learned. Let's start with learned. I don't know about you, but I can state for certain that my knowledge base and vocabulary increased because of my interactions with Kent Rogers. I knew the first time we met at my interview for the superintendent's position that he was quite brilliant. I remember having to ask him several times to please repeat his question, and I didn't understand why the other board members looked at each other and smiled. I kept wondering why they were smiling and not really making eye contact, but as I got to know Dr. Rogers, I knew that this was exactly what they had expected. I learned that not only were his interrogatories per purposeful, that his comments when he did speak were well informed. I loved the research articles that he would send me, even the scientific journal articles, which were way above my level of scientific understanding. Sometimes they were about an issue we were dealing with in the district. Other times they were about the nation or the world. Things that he found interesting and just wanted to share with others. He loved knowledge and he respected a thoughtful, informed discussion. Kent Rogers was respectful. He valued diversity. He accepted all people, no matter what their politics, their religious beliefs, the color of their skin or their wealth. During his 25 years on the Corsicana ISD School Board, he contributed to the success of several bonds that were responsible for the additions to the high school, renovations and updates to campuses 
the construction of Corsicana Middle School and Navarro Elementary. He led the board. He coached new board members. He provided his insight and guidance in difficult times, and he stood resolute when the district had to do what was right rather than what was easy. His love for the children of Corsicana and his desire to see our district and town grow and prosper never wavered. In his genuine caring and respect for every person, he exemplified the core beliefs of Corsicana ISD, educating every child, providing every child the greatest opportunity to learn, maintaining a safe and secure environment mentally, physically, emotionally, and academically because he understood that only in this environment can we really bring the best to our children. Kit Rogers was tireless. I quit trying to keep up with him in 2014 when he returned to service on the school board. I should have realized earlier when I heard about his stories when he was a team doctor. He traveled across the state with our athletic teams while tirelessly working and keeping up his own practice. Some of my favorite stories were about the years he spent as team physician for the Tigers. He waited until he knew me pretty well to share some of these stories, but he served our athletes and our coaches and our teams were more successful because of him. I soon learned that if I asked him a question, I would get a detailed response with references and citations. Sometimes immediately, sometimes at midnight, but I would get a thorough response. He was tireless in caring for the children of Corsicana ISD and in caring for our community. He seemed to have a second sense about where he was needed. So many times I would get a call during a football game. Could you get Dr. Rogers to come down on the field? We need him to look at an injury. We need his opinion. So I would hustle up those steps or take the elevator and get up to the VIP box where he was sitting and they wouldn't be up there. And I would look down on the field and he'd beat me down there. He seemed to know where he was needed. When you care deeply, you're always where you need to be. For CISD, the children and the adults, Keir Rogers did so much more than answer the call. He led us, he taught us, he inspired us. He served as the example for a life well lived. We will miss him terribly, but he will always be a part of the legacy of the Corsicana Tigers. Go Tigers.
Well, I, <laughs> I have to follow that. <laughs> I'm filing a formal complaint in the morning with this, whoever's in charge of the. Um, I love this wind. I think it's the Holy Ghost. First of all, I want to thank Donna and the family for uh, inviting me to speak. I'm going to try to make it through. I practice. I don't usually use extensive notes, but I've typed this up double space with big, gigantic fonts in case I need to get somebody else to read it for me. I'm not going to reference Donna again. Uh, that'd be a whole talk <laughs> that would go on. And we all know what a great team they were. So here we go. Kent Rogers was a tier above. Of course, Mark, he would want us to use sports vernacular. Kent punched above his weight class. He was the smartest doctor I ever met, and I've known a lot of smart doctors. As Neil said, Kent was number one in his medical school class. It's called the Ho Den Award, Southwestern. He trained in one of the most prestigious medicine programs in the world. And as Neil said, he could have been a professor at any medical school in this nation. But he was ours. Just Monday, two days ago, I had an issue in my practice. I thought, I need to ask Kent what he thinks. I don't have that anymore. I'll miss him. We'll all miss him. He was a backbone of our medical community. He was our lodestar. He made us aspire to be better doctors. Back to sports. Kent was in the bigs. The rest of us were at playing double A. When I first thought of this metaphor, I was thinking about us doctors. And the other day in the midst of my grief and anger, and Liz can back me up on this, I said out loud, no one knows, no one understands how special he was. But you know what? I was wrong. We all know, we all understand, doctors, nurses, patients, school administrators, teachers, students, coaches, just us folks. He made us all aspire to be better. Look at Course Candy Independent School District. Sandy, Susie, and Mark have been out of school for decades, but Kent devoted his heart and soul to CISD. I don't know much about the school board, but I do know that we have a lot of economically disadvantaged students, a lot learning English as a second language, and all students face a myriad of challenges. Kent wanted them all to succeed, to prosper. He lived it. Look at his commitment to public health and the health department. We're one of the most effective rural public health organizations in the state because of Kent. But it's more than that. We have a lot of poor and uninsured patients in our community. Kent wanted all to get excellent care and to be treated with dignity and compassion. Doctors and nurses volunteer down there. Foundations and community members contribute. All because of Kent. I can go on. Everybody's alluded to all the great ways he's impacted in Nevada County. Maybe it was an angel flying too close to the ground. I believe in angels. So do many of you. So I'm going to run with that. The other day I was talking to my son, Jim, about Kent. A lot of you know Jim. Jim has gotten under a lot of y'all's skin. But Jim is a Corsicana boy, and he loved Kent Rogers. Kent was his doctor and his mentor. Jim said to me, Besides my close family, Kent was the first adult to treat me as an adult. I know what he means. We all know what he means. I invite all of you to complete in your heart this sentence. Kent was the first person to do blank for me. I'll pause. 
We all have a story, a remembrance. I have many. Jim also said that he's studying the Stoics. I don't really know what that means. Kent would know. Kent knew everything. I think the take home message is that all highly effective people have an internal code, a commitment to do the right thing. I think because of Kent's faith and character, he was always going to do the right thing. The Stoics strove for the perfection of humanity. We will never be perfect, not even close, but we can be better. Kent Rogers made us better. <laughs> I was also reminded that the Vikings buried their great warriors with their swords in their hand. And I've stole, you've heard Jim's poem, I stole this from him. <laughs> Sorry, Jim. But they buried their great warriors with their swords in their hand to better get to heaven. They call it something else, Valhalla, but we know it is heaven. And Cat was a great warrior. We know that he's in heaven, praise be to God. Let us honor Cat by defeating this terrible enemy, this terrible disease. Please wear your mask. Wash your hands. Socially distance and get your vaccine as soon as possible. And I want to thank Eric and Chief Henley and Judge Davenport, Kurt Junkins, and all those who've worked so hard on our vaccine program. Get in line if you haven't been jabbed already. I love Kent Rogers. We all did. Let's win this one. We owe it to Kent. He died with his sword in his head. I want to reassure Neil Green, I don't plan to reenact the dinner scene from Untouchables with my bat, so everything will be okay. Bob, well done. Thank you. I had one other thing I wanted to say, and Dad, I'm going to forgot it, but it'll come to me. I've got to remember the third one, so I've looked at it. So, But I'm Mark Rogers. A lot of you know me. You've heard the name Tank a lot, and that's one of my 50 nicknames, but um, I want to start off and say what a beautiful day. This is, you know, Father Monk, when we were talking about this and setting this up, you nailed it. Thank you, Ed. Fabulous. And I want to thank everyone for being here. You took time out of your day to honor such a great man. He's a wonderful father. We'll miss him dearly. But I want to be a little selfish right now and thank my uh, classmates, Nine Deuce in the house. You guys sent a great flower set, and it's just beautiful. Thank you. Stacy G, you always keep it going, baby girl. Thank you. Always there when you call and always on time. Always teamwork in that class, and that leads me into the next section of Block Your Man. We've heard that a ton. I learned that a long time ago. It's really about a sense of being, being a team, going through, doing their job, handling your responsibilities in business, being successful and an outcome is attainable. It comes with teamwork, unity, and strength. There's plenty out there in the world that can discount this pandemic. And I get it, and I understand that. Well, let me tell you something, and I'm gonna use a coach's phrase that I've got a lot of coach friends in this, in this group right now. And it's really hard, and I feel a little bit bad to say it. Mom, I'm, it's not a bad word, I'm just letting you know. Kent, Donna, to me, you know how it works. But it's really a sense of, hey, you know, when it gets close to home and you, you know, look at me and maybe ask me about it, I'm just going to look, what do you want to do next? Do you want to sit on the sidelines to get your fat ass in the game? Your choice. But block your man is a big thing. I always learned it from my dad. It, his coach taught it to him. I heard it from many of my coaches. If you block your man, everything else will fall in place. 
that's how it works. I've got a couple of funny stories. I'm going to try to set this bat down so it doesn't fall because I want to use my hands a little. Dad was very private in terms of working with his patients. It was a very strict thing, but he said, you know, if we heard it out or one of his patients told a story to us, it was okay at that point because they had shared it. But I got a couple of stories I want to tell, one being about Tim Hartley. We missed him. We loved him. We lost him to this disease, but he fought hard. But Tim caught me one day after playing golf at the country club, and he said, I mean, with that huge smile he has, he says, Mark, I'm Tim Hartley. I go, Tim, I know you. Don't worry. It's good to see you. He goes, man, I sure love your daddy. I love going up there and going to the and seeing him, you know, visit with him at the office. But I tell you what, he can be a little tough. I said, really? Like, I don't know that. But, you know, uh, he told me, he goes, you know, I was at my annual visit and I was up there and I'd been sitting in the room and he came in. And he had all of his lab reports and everything, and he comes in and he looks at me, looks down at the, the reports again, and he looks at me again. Tim, yes, sir, you're fat. You need to lose weight. <laughs> Tim, stunned, he's just like, Mark, I, I just kind of sit there, and I looked at him and go, well, Doc, is that all? My dad goes, no, I got a little more. Let's keep talking. So anyway, but. And then the other one was Jimbo Parts. Jimbo caught me one night, and he goes, Tank, your daddy got me. I go, what happened? He goes, man, I was at my annual visit, and it was that time where, you know, that gland gets a little massaged, and Jimbo was worried about it, and he goes, I just don't know what your dad's going to do. I go, you got to tell me. He goes, man, I'm in the gown. I'm sitting in the room waiting on him. I'm nervous as hell, and I just do that. And, of course, Dad, you know, he and Jimbo have a great relationship, always have, always will, and it's just the sense of Jimbo was just scared, and my dad came up with a good one. Before he came in there, he had gotten a bovine glove that comes up to here and had it. So when he walked in the room, he slammed the door and popped that thing and goes, Jimbo, you ready? Jimbo said he jumped off that bench and tried to run out, but Dad was laughing so hard and brought him back in. Man, that's one of the best stories. Jimbo, I, I hope I told that right. That's what I remember from that night. So I'll, I know you'll correct me if we need to. My dad valued education. It's been already set up here so many times. You know, in a statement in the paper, he said, educating the children makes us a better country, better democracy, it makes life better in this country. Very powerful. One thing I want to let you know that my mom told me last night, she, she had talked to uh, someone at the uh, medical school at UT Southwestern and had just been talking for hours, and she got off the phone and goes, man, that lady can talk. But anyway, so there was a lot of good conversation there. They had been hit with so many calls about my dad and how wonderful he was and all of this stuff that UT Southwestern will now put a scholarship in place for my dad. What a way to carry that on. Unbelievable. And as my dad started out, he was valedictorian of his class in high school. He was headed to Texas Tech, but Rice called and said, we got a spot for you. But dad and mom were married at that point, and he had to go down and talk to a chancellor, and they worked it out. So my parents are the first married couple that entered Rice University the first year. There, my dad was structured in two first, in his two first years in what he took. He went in to be an engineer like my grandfather, but quickly found sciences in his junior year. Halfway through that, that uh, in his next, almost to his second semester in junior year, he had loved sciences so much, the biologies, everything, that he just fell in love and, and thought he would be a professor on the faculty teaching biology. But he went back home and he talked to uh, the hometown doctor there in Mount Pleasant, Dr. Lee McKellar. And Dr. McKellar just looked at my dad and said, Kent, what do you think about medicine? Do you have any interest? He goes, Dr. McKellar, I don't know if I'm that smart to do that. But he said, you know what, why don't you reach out to UTSW or find some medical school you want and see what happens. Well, Dad did, sent in his transcripts, but I will say this, the first, in his first two semesters, my dad made a C, and that was the lowest grade he ever made. And he was really worried about sending that transcript in. So then he got an interview set up, and he talked to somebody from Southwestern, and they came down and talked, and they said, Kent, I don't know, you got a year and a half to graduate, I don't, we're not going to have a spot for you. If you take the NCAT and then come back, we'll talk. 
Well, so dad took the MCAT, and guess what? They talked again, and they said, you know, Kent, you're in a year and a half graduate, you'll be available in that next class, you'll be able to go in. And it started from there. He was there for four years. For three and a half of those years, he was number one. He didn't pay tuition because of that, because that's how it worked. He did receive the Hoden. He went off to Boston, then the Navy, back to Dallas, and then in Corsicana, Texas in 1976. And now, as Paul Harvey always said, you know the rest of the story. But in education, he met his match with a teacher that a lot of us had. When we were growing up, he, met, he went against Bill Laporis. And Mr. Laporis is my Algebra II teacher, and I'm still struggling with the FOIL method, which first outer, inner, last. I'm not going to explain it. Go YouTube it. But you can figure it out. So I got home one night, and Dad came in and knocked on the door. Hey, you need any help with your homework? I go, Dad, I'm struggling with this. Math really wasn't our best thing, but we went through it and tried it. Anyway, got the, got the homework done, turned it in the next day. And then the following day, Mr. Laporis handed out the results. Let me tell you something. It wasn't good. But Bill looked at me and goes, Mark, who helped you with your homework? It's my dad. Okay. Sat down in the class. Mr. LaForce goes, hey, Mark, come here. This is a note I want you to give to your dad. Okay, no problem. So I took it home, and I told my mom, I said, Dad, you know, Dad's got a note from Mr. LaForce. And we went to the same church with Bill and his family. <laughs> but Dad got home. My mom gave him the note. He looked at it took it back and I can't remember if I got the found out that night what it said but I it, whatever it was I found out later and it simply said Kent please stick to medicine I'll take care of the algebra <laughs> baseball is something my dad truly loves he got it from my uncle Ted Ted it's only five years older than my dad <clears throat> thought I could make it anyway so he and Ted were like brothers. They're technically uncle and nephew, but they were really like brothers. And dad loved Ted, and Ted really, really sharpened his baseball game because my dad knows a lot about it. Ted, and I know you and Libby are watching. We love you. I know this is tough. But we got to go to Omaha, and I thank Gary Aiden for that every day because we have a such great family up there, and we can't wait to get back to see you guys. We love you guys too. That brings up another great story. I'm trying to make this light because there's so many great stories. But dad and mom were in their first year of medical school. And Paul Strong, one of their best friends from growing up, was getting married in Illinois. So Paul was up there and mom and dad, you know, they live in the West Dallas Projects at that time. So they caught a greyhound up to, up to Illinois. The gray dog, as my mama calls it. So they get up there and, you know, they make stops along the way. But my mom, in that preparation of that wedding weekend, had bought a great new dress at Sanger Harris, and it was in those bags. Well, they get to Illinois, and they find out in Oklahoma they lost all their luggage. So they only had the clothes in their bags. So they spent the entire ceremony and the, the wedding weekend up there with the clothes they had, borrowing clothes and making it work. So they decided after that weekend to fly back home. They flew out of Illinois, and then they flew into St. Louis. They had a layover, and it wasn't going to the next day. They didn't have a hotel room, unfortunately. So my dad, one of my dad's very dear friends, Jerry Boatner, was around in that area and helped them get a room downtown. My mom called it a broom closet, but they made it work. Their flight was 10 o'clock the next day, and, of course, my dad was looking around at the paper and found out and looked up at my mom and goes, Smirky, they're playing two over at Bush. we got to go see the doubleheader. We got plenty of time. My mom's like, okay, you know, I'm sure my mom did this a lot. You know, okay, Kent. Well, they go to the go over to the doubleheader. They've got plenty of time, but they go into extra innings. And my dad would, or my mom would jab jab dad about that. So think about two 12 inning games in one day, and then they almost missed their flight. But they get home back to Dallas. Love that story, and always will. My last piece here is really about leadership and mentorship. Bob and Neil have hit on that really hard. Dr. Frost, everybody has. Eric, you guys have nailed it. I think back to, a, to an interview I caught that a friend of mine texted me. Jeff Lucas is a dear friend of mine. He shot it over. He goes, Tank, you got to watch this. And it was Matt Rule one day, his former head coach at Baylor. I think this was last year. So I turn on the interview, and it's just about practice. And they're interviewing coach, and they go, Coach, what happened at practice today? 
And if you know Matt Rule, he's a motivator. He's fun to listen to. But he basically said, he laid out the day, he said, you know, I had two guys come late to work, to, to practice. Sent them home. They didn't want to be there. Hey, you can have a rough day. Go home. Come back next tomorrow. You better be ready. So then they said, I got into practice. I had two coaches that weren't coaching. Sent them home. If you want to coach, that's fine. You better come back tomorrow and do it. And then he said, we got through practice another five minutes. I just sent the team home. I said, you guys don't want to be here today. Go home. So Matt said he just went up to the Elite Cafe, had sausage, gravy, and biscuits, sat to himself, and then just went home. Hey, we're all going to have days like that. My dad told me that once. You're going to have days like that, but you button it up and get your butt back the next day and get after it. Because I can tell you what, my dad, if he did have a day like that, I never knew it. I don't think we ever saw it. That guy went to work sick. He did whatever he needed to. He made it work. I'll tell you what was a saving grace that really helped us on Saturday as we left the hospital after my father passed. And Father Ed was there, thank goodness, but my, my sister Susie and I were there. My mom was really at a point where she really needed to sit by herself, and she did. But a young man came up as we were in the drive there, Lewis Gibson surgery, that, that area in the back of the hospital. We were loading up the car, and a young man walked up. He had looked like he'd been struck by lightning, hit by a car. He was just stunned. Young man's name's MZ, and I hope I get it right, but I'm trying to remember a lot of that story. But he walked up, and he could hardly speak, but he finally got some words out, and he said, is this Dr. Rogers' family? He was talking to Father Ed, and he said, yes. And he talked to me, and he, he said, you know, I just found out Dr. Rogers died. I can't believe it. I thought he was okay two, two, two days ago, and I, haven't, I just came back to work after being off. I can't believe he's gone. I interned here. I worked here. And I got to know Dr. Rogers. And during that time, my mom got sick and was, went up to the third floor and was there for a few days. And when she was there, I, I assumed she got out, and he told me a bill came to the house, and it was $21,000. I'm not going into anything about hospital bills or those stuff happened. But what really the point of the story is, this next point doesn't surprise me one bit. And John, I believe you're a part of this. I can't remember the third, but if I recall correctly, he mentioned that my dad and two other doctors, and John, I believe he told your name, paid that bill for that young man. Pretty good, right? Let me top that one for you. This young man was dedicated to his job. My dad sees talent. He's just got an unbelievable eye for it. And he can develop it. Just unbelievable. So the young man, as dedicated as he was, I'm sure I told my dad what his dreams were to go to medical school. My dad wrote him a letter of recommendation to medical school. MZ, go off and do great things. My dad wants you to do that. And his colleagues, who he's known for years, who he's mentored, that will strive from this point on and continue my dad's legacy. Go do great things, young man. I'm closed with this. I know I've gone a little longer, but I really don't care. Closing in the meeting with my, and my mom called me, and it was FaceTime. They said, we need to talk to you. Actually, they called me on the phone, and it was, they wanted to do FaceTime. And I kind of had an idea. This is last week. And I said, Jennifer, can you come in and be with me? Well, they called me and we got on the phone. My dad told me his plan for his last wishes. And I'm never arguing with my dad. Like Coach Barry said on the call last week, recently, he said, your dad is a thinker, man. He thinks, thinks, thinks. And he makes good decisions. We knew it was a tough one. He had laid it out when all this started, and we knew it, we got to a point we're going to have to talk. But I'll share you some final words he told me. I'm so proud of you. Mark, you've achieved every dream I've had for you. After some commentary, he told, he told me that, you know, he loved me. And that mom and dad loved, loved us dearly. And I said, Dad, you know, I'm so glad you, met, you got to know my wife. She was a wonderful lady. But we're not done yet. I may not ever reach your stature, but I'm damn sure going to try. We've got a lot of work to do. Eric, Emily, Maria, H.M., Chief Henley, Bob, Neil, all of his colleagues here, Dr. Shafiq, Dr. Updegrove, 
John Biltz, I know, is here. Charlie, you're still involved and always be influential with me. You're my godfather. Dan, Janie, <sighs> Freddie, I think you're here too, but all of the close friends of the family, Tony, Eddie, everybody, we've got a job to do and we're gonna do it right. So with that saying, I'll close with this. Block your damn man. In the beginning of the third chapter of the book of the Wisdom of Solomon, it's recorded that Solomon said that the souls of the righteous are in the hand of God, and no torment will ever touch them. In the eyes of the foolish they seem to have died, and their departure was thought to be a disaster, and their going from us to be their destruction. I know that I'm not alone in wondering these last few days how in the world Corsicana and Navarro County are going to get along without Kent Eugene Rogers at the tiller of so many parts of our common life. You've heard this evening the testimonies of family and friends and colleagues and everyone here gathered and everyone watching knows in ways that won't be expressed the impact that Kent had on our lives and in our community. I've been blessed. I've been blessed in the course of being a priest to stand next to some giants. I've had the privilege of my ministry to stand next to presidents and governors, senators and congressmen. Many of you have had that opportunity as well. I've even had the opportunity to stand next to popes and cardinals and archbishops, people that the world thought were as big as it can possibly get. I've been blessed to walk by these people, to shake their hand, and to walk away feeling proud for a moment that I got to meet them. Yet the feeling faded after a day or two. It took me a while to figure it out, it turns out I cared more about them than they did about me. It was important to me to meet these people, but to them I was nothing more than a, another person in a long line of well-wishers. I realize now that the depth 
of my grief in these last few days for the loss of my friend, my colleague, my parishioner, my doctor, is amplified because I was blessed for almost 20 years to stand with a giant who cared as much about me as I did about him. I recognize that all of us have been impacted by a real giant who stood in the midst of our lives. And I am sad that he is no longer with us, but I am sadder, my friends, that I took that gift for granted on an everyday basis because it seemed like it would always be there. What made Kent Rogers a giant? You all know. But in 1971, Kent was presented as some have referenced the Hoden Award by the Southwestern Medical Foundation. Less than 1% of the people that graduate from UT Southwestern receive this award. It's given to someone who exemplifies the unique personal qualities embodied in all great physicians. Knowledge, understanding, and in the words of the UT Medical Found of the Southwestern Medical Foundation, most of all, compassion. You all know it, we've already heard it, but Kent was usually the smartest person in most rooms. But yet he never flaunted it, did he? He didn't use his knowledge in a belittling or a demeaning way. If you served with Kent in any capacity over the years, you might have gotten to take one of his famous vocabulary quizzes. Always administered with a sense of something that we can all learn today. Taking these quizzes the first or second time, I realized that I'd bet, better start reading the New York Times every day if I was going to keep up with the words that he was talking about. Any of you who've ever sat in an exam room with Kent, and thank goodness, Mark, he didn't bring out that bovine glove with me, but if you ever sat in that exam room with Kent, you know the joy of the wonderful notes and diagrams written on your lab report and handed over to you. And by the time the appointment was done, you'd probably have an explanation, Dr. Green, of the Krebs cycle on there somewhere and how that affected your everyday life. Maybe you didn't get to see this example, but I did, and I know Donna did, was to see Kent Rogers full of steroids while sitting in a hospital room in Baylor and to see his face light up whenever a resident would walk in. What can I teach today? And the conversation always began with Kent saying, do you know why blank? And in the back, Donna doing this. Cut, cut. He knew a lot. He knew a lot. And he knew how to share that knowledge in a way that made all of us feel like we were his partners. His partners in learning, his partners in our care, his partners in any endeavor that we were doing. Kent was full of knowledge. But the second characteristic in receiving that award is understanding. Kent understood, understood what he was doing. And understanding sometimes is coupled with knowledge as a sign that one has grasped a concept. But understanding also means knowing the people you're working with and striving to make others as successful as you are by meeting them where they need to be met. Kent's deep personal humility led him to depths of understanding that most of us will never reach. For Kent, knowing how and why things worked led him to seek how to know that they might work better. This could be what's going on in a school board meeting, what's going on with a patient, what's going on in the world. He wanted to know why so that he could understand how and then could understand how to make it better. As Eddie said to me the other day though, sometimes you had to remind him that you only want to know the time, not how to build a clock. But for many of us, I know me, this understanding led him to be the person I needed him to be in the moment that I needed him to be that person. 
Because he was humble, he had not much need for recognition. If you recall everything that went into the statue that's downtown, he didn't want that. But he needed us to know how things worked. And if that meant putting a statue up so that people would understand the importance of health care, then so be it. When I needed to complain, Kent was a listener. When I needed to act, Kent was an enabler. When I was offsides, Kent was a referee. When I needed direction, Kent was a coach. Very few will realize that even in the midst of a pandemic, Kent went to bat for the good of our community. Why? Because he understood the need of our entire community and he was humble enough to understand what needed to be done so that everyone could succeed and live and thrive in the safest way possible. Finally, and most importantly, recipients of that Hoden Award are people who show compassion. And we could talk forever about Kent's brilliance or his understanding. These things made him a good doctor and a good co-worker. What made him great and a giant among all of us was his compassion. I don't know that I've ever had the privilege of meeting someone who had his or her soul plumbed with the depths of compassion of Dr. Kent Rogers. His ability to suffer alongside of us never tempted him to be slowed, even in the midst of everything he was going through. Most Monday nights, our CISD board meetings could last until 7.30 or 8, and after these meetings, Kent was rarely seen headed home, but rather back to the office to take care of more patients. At one time in his life, I'm told, Kent might have even enjoyed some days off, but lately that didn't happen either, did it? Most often, Kent would get home around 9, have a bowl of cereal, and fall asleep in his chair so that he could be back up at it around 5 in the morning. If you ever had the fortune of having the 7 a.m. televisit with Kent, you know that he was way too chipper for 7 in the morning, but he was always full of compassion. Even in the midst of his own limitations, he was worried about others. When he first started having to carry his oxygen with him everywhere he went, he was worried about what his patients might think if they saw that tube because he was concerned that they would be more worried about him than he needed to be about them. And his goal was to find a solution that would satisfy his need to worry about his patient. You've already heard the stories this afternoon, so I won't repeat them here. Everybody has a story, I think, that, doc that could say that what, something similar to this. Dr. Rogers saved my life whether it was physically or mentally or emotionally, or just by being a friend, a colleague, or a mentor. He was able to do this because he had compassion. I have to say that while Kent was in the hospital, his texts to me, and this is how we communicated, his texts to me were always full of concern about others always wanting to know how somebody else was doing, asking me about my own family in the midst of lying in a hospital bed, asking me how someone else was in the midst of his own suffering, being concerned for what was going on in our community while he was sick. As Bob said, Kent could have been anywhere. He could have been a professor at any medical school. He could have been in a big hospital somewhere. He could have been anywhere, but he chose to be with us. Kent's specialty was internal medicine. At least that's what the sign on the door says. But that wasn't his chosen career. And that's what I want us to think about for a few minutes this evening. I want us to think about what Kent Rogers' chosen vocation, what he was called to do, really was. Because even though the sign said internal medicine, his chosen career was primary care. His chosen career was primary care. Think about that. What does that mean to be in primary care? That means to care first. 
to care first. From the beginning to the end, from Genesis to Revelation, the Bible reminds us that one of our greatest opportunities in this world is to care first, to be in primary care. St. James writes in the second chapter and eighth verse of his letter, if you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. Kent Rogers was a person that cared about others primarily. Cared about others as much as he did himself. In fact, that is one of the aspirational goals of the Bible. My brother Kent crossed the finish line of primary care way ahead of you and me. He crossed in, in the example of his Lord. Kent lived out the very words of Jesus as Neil said in John 15, 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Despite being at the top of the risk list, Kent threw himself headlong into the fight against COVID, spearheading not only our county efforts, but leading the charge for our own Episcopal Diocese of Dallas, assisting, assisting churches across 24 counties in their battle against COVID as well. But you already know that Kent was willing to lay down his life for his friends because in some way he had done it for each of you as he did it for me. One of the last texts that I received from Kent as he was worried about his own family and friends and his health, he reminded me to primarily care about others. He asked me in one of the messages that he sent to me to never forget the goal that he and Charlie and I had taken up a couple of years before. And that was to establish in this town a federally qualified health center for meeting the needs of indigent persons in our community. And I promise you, Kent, that we won't let you down on that. We will work as hard as we have to do to make sure that the needs of the poor who need medical care in this town and in this county are met, because it's one of the last things that you asked us to do. Living into this is what made Kent Rogers a giant of a man, a hero in our community because he practiced every day primary care. Isaac Newton said, if I have seen farther, it's because I was able to stand upon the shoulders of giants. Friends, you and I have seen farther because we have been blessed to stand upon the shoulder of a giant and to have one in our midst for lo these many years who showed us what primary care for others really looks like. It now falls to us, all of us, because it will take all of us to live into the work that was begun during the life of Kent Rogers. Our challenge is to collectively carry on that primary care work in our community by each of us picking up a piece of the work that needs to be done. It's so tempting in the world we live in today to drop that ball, and we can't let it happen. As I was with Kent and Donna Friday night, the last thing that Kent said to me was that I am profoundly tired an indication that he had used all of his strength in the fight that he had fought during that time that he was in the hospital. But just before that, just before those final words, he said to me, and I know Donna heard it too, remind them to wear their masks. Remind them to wear their masks. If nothing else, wear that mask in the honor of the legacy of Dr. Kent Rogers. It may be hard to wear a mask, but guess what? Primary care is hard. It may be uncomfortable, but so is understanding other people. It may feel strange across your face, but so does learning new things. It may be that the life you save is your own. It may be someone else's. 
But if you're willing to lay down your own interests for someone else, then wearing that mask, as Kent asked us to do, is not that hard. In putting that mask on every day, we honor someone who laid down literally his life for so many of us. As we heard at the beginning today, what seems to the world to be foolish and a destruction is nothing more than a sign that Kent's soul is now in the hands of God. And as we, my friends, have been privileged to see farther by standing on the shoulders of a giant, may we take up his cause as well and allow others to see farther by letting them stand on our shoulders, by offering to them the primary care that was offered to you and to me. We've been blessed. We've been blessed to receive the gift of love, the gift of compassion, the gift of care from our dear friend, Dr. Rogers. Our lives will never be the same because he changed who we are by changing who we are. And so let us now give thanks for his life, but most of all, let us honor the work that he begun among us by continuing it and by practicing primary care one for the other. May God bless Kent as he's with him today, and may God bless each one of us as we remember him. Abide with me, fast falls the eventide, the darkness deepens, Lord, with me abide, when other helpers fail and sorrows see. O oh, thou who failest not, abide with me. I need thy presence every passing hour. What but thy grace can foil the tempter's power? Who like thyself my guide and stay can be through cloud and sunshine? Oh, abide with me. Hold thou thy cross before my closing eye. Shine through the gloom and point me to the sky. Heaven's morning breaks and earth's vain shadows flee. In life, in death, O oh Lord, abide with me.
As we conclude this evening, please join me in prayer. O oh God of grace and glory, we remember before you this day our brother Kent. We thank you for giving him to us, his family and friends, to know and to love as a companion on our earthly pilgrimage. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see in death the gate of eternal life, so that in quiet confidence we may continue our course on earth until by your call we are reunited with those who have gone before. Father of all, we pray to you for Kent and for all those whom we love but see no longer. Grant to them eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon him. May his soul and the souls of all the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. The God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Our service is concluded. Let us go in peace.